views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Every 20 years, New York State voters have a chance to decide if they want to begin the process to amend the state's constitution. So on your ballot next week will be Proposal 1, asking if voters want a convention to amend the state constitution. The dialogue leading up to Election Day on a so-called con-con constitutional convention has been highly controversial with groups that are usually on the same sides of issues on opposite sides of this one. And many who usually fall on opposing sides of issues agreeing on a constitutional convention. For example, both the NRA and the UFT are urging their members to vote no. Planned Parenthood and the women's group which helped organize the Women's March in New York City have lined up on opposite sides of this issue. So what do you think? Is it time to let voters change things in the Constitution, like amending ethics rules or gun control? Or, as some fear, will this open the door for rolling back worker protections and commitments to pensions? We've invited two well-connected Bronxites to debate the issue so that you can be as informed as possible when you go to cast your vote on Election Day, which, of course, is November 7. And I'm sorry to say, and it leads into another whole dialogue, Supporting the Constitutional Convention was slated to be former Bronx Assemblyman and current member of the New York Post editorial board, Michael Benjamin. Mr. Benjamin has called us when he can. He's stuck on the subway underground, and so he is not here at the moment. If he gets here, we'll put him right in. We'll try to cover both sides of the issue anyway. But uh, who uh, a, um, a representative who does not think it's a very good idea, the Assemblyman in the 81st Assembly District, in the Bronx, welcome back to Jeffrey Dinner. It's nice to have you, sir. It's good to be here again. Before, yes, before we talk about Khan Khan, you have been um, uh, honored by the people at the Riders Council and have been an advocate um, uh, for improving our transit. It's a perfect chance to give you an opportunity to talk about what's wrong and what you see as potential solutions. Well, before we get into the <laughs> other debate. Well, the Riders Alliance did honor me uh, last week, and I'm really disappointed <laughs> But once again, the trains are stuck, and I was looking forward to debating my friend and former colleague, Michael Benjamin, but we may not have that opportunity unless he gets here in the middle of the show. Uh, unless that D train starts moving, I guess. I, there's so much work to be done with, with, the, with the subway system and the buses. Uh, it's, I, I think we've made some headway, but you know, ask a rider who gets stuck on the train for an hour if we've made improvements, and I'm sure the answer is no. So we have lots to do, and we have a lot of uh, a lot of money is going to have to be spent to do the job that needs to be done to uh, really make the improvements. It wouldn't be me if I didn't ask you. You had, um, I think, suggested that uh, we take a look at the people in the highest income brackets and, and maybe tax them or do something to, you know, get some of their uh, route some of their uh, monies away toward MTA. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of enthusiasm for that proposal. Is that still alive? Well, there are a number of proposals out there, a uh, millionaire's tax, some people support congestion pricing, uh, uh, others have suggested we earmark part of this, specifically earmark part of the state budget, uh, income taxes uh, for mass transit. So there are a number of different proposals, and there's no reason we can't do a little bit of everything. I think we have to come to a solution with this. We can't be debating forever on how to bring in money, but also... One thing which really disturbs me is that upstate 
legislators will have a significant say in this since uh, it's the state legislature ultimately that has to make these decisions. Well, this leads right into a uh, constitutional convention um, dialogue because this would be the kind of thing that voters could say, you know what, we like the idea of amending the Constitution, and that would, for example, change the tax code or earmark a certain percentage of uh, the state budget for uh, a, um, a mass transit upgrade. And in fact, one of the other questions that has come up is whether or not we ought to, you know, even look at New York City and split it away in some form from uh, the state of New York so that what you just expressed concern about, upstaters would not be the ones to have a say in how we manage things like uh, mass transit or other issues that we have, mayoral control of the schools, for example, that have nothing to do with them. Well, first let me start by saying amending the state constitution can be done by the legislature and the governor, just like amending the federal constitution can be done uh, it's a little more cumbersome. You have to get three-quarters of the states and two-thirds of Congress to go along with an amendment, and that's a cumbersome process. But that's deliberate because the founding fathers, and they were fathers, um, they, don't, they didn't want uh, the willy-nilly the uh, Constitution being amended frequently, so a process was set up on the federal level to make it very slow, very deliberative, for better or worse, that's the process. On the state level, it's actually a lot easier. In fact, the state constitution has been amended over 200 times, and the process is, is that two successive state legislatures have to vote for an amendment. That means the Senate and the Assembly vote for it, and then when the next set of senators and Assembly members come into office... Two years later. Two, it could, well, it could be the next year, depending upon... I it's, see. It's, it's two separate elections worth of right. legislators. So, so that's right. If it, if it coincides with a changeover, right. then it could be two years in a row. So okay. like next year is 2018. We can right. vote on an amendment, and then in 2019, we can, uh, the next legislature can do it. If that happens, then it goes before the voters. And in fact, this year, there's an amendment on the ballot. The amendment that's on the ballot, that the legislature put on the ballot, uh, essentially says that uh, public officials who are convicted of official corruption will lose their state pension. Now, uh, under the current Constitution, that can't happen because your pension rights are guaranteed and cannot be diminished. And it was always a sore point with a lot of people, and rightly so, that why should some crook who used his or her office be able to then get a pension. So this amendment will give the voters the opportunity to say no more on that. So that's an example of amending the Constitution without putting everything up for grabs. Many people uh, who are progressive thinkers, I think uh, if people were to chart your uh, legislative record, they would consider you to be a progressive, would say, well, you know what? We could put in the Constitution a right to clean air and water. We could put mm -hmm. campaign finance reform in there. We could talk about the legalization of marijuana. Uh, we could handle a lot of things that, frankly, ethics rules, uh, the, the, the legislature has not been able to get done. This would be a way of doing it and a way for the people of the state of New York to say, you know what? This would be a good idea. Why can't we make this happen? We want to make it happen. Uh, isn't, isn't this a good path to do that? Well, all, everything you said is true, but there's a big but at the end of that. Uh, yes, there are a lot of things that the state legislature and governor have not done yet. Uh, there are a lot of things we have done, but there are a lot of things that we should do that there has been no agreement on up until now. And it's true, a constitutional convention can do all those things or not because what would happen is at a constitutional convention, and by the way, New York State's Constitution is a 40-plus page document. It's not this little pocket thing uh, <laughs> that, that the federal, con it, it's really a very long document, has a lot of stuff in it, a lot of important protections. At a convention, everything is on the table. Everything is on the chopping block. And depending upon who becomes the delegates to that convention, great things could happen or really, really bad things can happen. And I'm not a gambler. You have to weigh the potential for good things happening versus the possibility of really bad things happen. And unless the potential for good outweighs and significantly outweighs the bad, I wouldn't go for it. And when, why do I say this? The delegates to the convention are chosen. There are 204 of them. 
They're chosen based upon Senate districts, 63 Senate districts, 3 per Senate district, plus 15 are elected at large. The Senate districts would, are hyper-gerrymandered, drawn by the Republicans. There's a chance that the delegates to the convention could be delegates that people like me would not want. There's also no campaign finance uh, limits on how much money could be spent to elect delegates. So right-wing uh, super PACs like uh, the Koch brothers, the Mercers, could contribute, they could contribute $100 million if they want. Would they want to do that? Who knows? The, uh, Robert Mercer just contributed to this Westchester County uh, uh, executives race he just contributed a million dollars to the Republican candidate. To him, contributing a million dollars is like me contributing ten dollars. Is this a way, uh, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, is this a way of, frankly, speeding up the process? It may, people will say, well, we're going to wait for the legislature on some of the issues that I brought up, ethics reform, uh, you know, more stringent uh, environment rules, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is this a way to move things forward a little bit faster and let the people really take control of uh, the, the agenda for the state? And that could include, again, uh, splitting up, um, uh, you know, uh, the upstaters and downstaters and put some, uh, some controls in place so that New York City can... Um, monitor and maintain its own budget and regulations without the influence of the upstate and, of course, vice versa. Well, I, I don't think that's likely to happen at a convention. Uh, it could speed things up, but here's what's on the chopping block. Right now, people who have the pensions, if you're a retired UFT member, for example, or a current UFT member, your pension rights are guaranteed. Whatever you are entitled to now could never be diminished under the state constitution. Other states have done, have made changes like that, much to the detriment of workers. Uh, the right to collectively bargain is in the constitution. Uh, workers' comp, constitution. The forever wild clause, uh, which protects the Adirondack State Park and the Catskill State Park from development, is in the constitution. So your, your concern now is, and, and really, if, if you analyze it, it could flip either way because some of the you know, things that I've read have said, well, you know what, we could make the pension system stronger. And others have said, well, it's going to put uh, the pensions uh, up for jeopardy. Uh, it, it's hard to measure well, 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 which way it will go. Well, think about it. Virtually every labor union, if not every labor union, including the UFT, 1199, DC 37, up and down the line, public and private, they are all opposed to the Constitutional Convention. They're opposed to it because they're concerned about losing their collective bargaining rights, about the diminution of their pensions. It's no accident that they're opposed. Why are, why are education groups opposed to it? Because the Constitution guarantees the right to a public education, to a sound basic education. That could be taken away if the pro-charter forces bring their mega bucks into this race uh, that, that may happen to elect delegates. Why are the environmental groups against the Constitutional Convention? Because they don't want to see the Forever Wild Clause eliminated. Uh, just a point of history and then also I, I will have you take your advocate it's hard for you I know to take your advocates hat off and let's just talk about specifically how it might work uh, the history is that we had a constitutional convention the last time was 1967 but uh, the uh, recommendations were uh, eventually turned down um, but then in 1938, which takes us way back, uh, there was a, a constitutional convention which created a safety net for the poor. Um, it, it also created what we now look at as a labor bill of rights. So isn't there a hopeful way of looking at this and saying, you know what, if we go through this process, and I do want you to talk about the process in a second, um, if we go through this process, maybe we'll be able to do more things that will help people than not. Well, I try to be hopeful. I mean, I could not possibly be in this job if I wasn't hopeful. But 1938 was during the era of FDR, during the New Deal, when a lot of really great things were happening and happening for the first time. We are in the era of Trump. We are in the era, era of unlimited campaign dollars when you have ultra-right-wing groups spending countless sums of money everywhere to elect people, and they're going to use that money to elect delegates. So, uh, yes, I'm hopeful, but I'm also, I also try to be smart about things, and I don't want to put at risk 
these wonderful things that we have in the Constitution. Do we need to do those things you mentioned? You bet we do. We need campaign finance reform. We need ethics reform. We need a lot of things uh, that haven't been done yet. And we've done a lot of ethics reforms. But every time we do ethics reform and then somebody else does something bad, we have to do more ethics reform, and we should. Uh, but we can do that, and maybe one day if we elect the Democratic State Senate, we will do that. Uh, but uh, we have a process in place to change the state constitution. It's worked over 200 times, and I fail to see any reason to deviate from that process and put everything else that we've gained over the years at risk. Let's uh, uh, just um, explain to people how this is going to work. So as I understand it, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that if in fact this proposal were to pass, then that would begin a process where 200, uh, up to 200 delegates would be elected, and then next year they would, uh, those delegates um, would be selected and start to meet to uh, uh, discuss right. what would be on, it would the, be uh, 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 on uh, the proposal. On election day, uh, November 7th, when you go to vote, on the back of your ballot are the proposals. Proposal number one is whether or not to hold the Constitutional Convention. If the voters vote no, and I hope they vote no, uh, <laughs> that's the end of it. If they vote yes, then next year there will be a primary election and then a general election to elect three delegates in each Senate district plus 15 statewide. So what will happen is if there are contests, and since, peop since the supporters call this the People's Convention, uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of people running for these positions. You'll have globs of names on the ballots, along with governor, lieutenant governor, United States Senate, con controller, attorney general, assembly, Congress. All the things that uh, will be on the, on the ballot anyway. Plus, uh, plus maybe a couple of dozen names for these delegates. It'll be the most crowded ballot in history. Um, and, and that election process can, will be very expensive. Just out of curiosity, can elected officials also become delegates for the convention? Not only can they become delegates, but many of them will become delegates. Why? Because the delegates will get paid the same salary as a state assemblyman or a state senator, which is $79,500 a year. And so if you're, a, let's say, a state senator or an assemblyman, you could run, and if you're elected as delegate, you get both salaries. You collect both salaries, and that, so that factors you're into your pension. You're suggesting that uh, many elected officials would would seek this, I, especially I, in the state where many people believe that right, it's paid possible. And, and there are other elected officials besides state legislators that uh, might consider running for that. But who would who would be the toughest contenders? Who would be the most likely winners? Well, elected officials, political insiders, lobbyists. Those are the people who are going to have a big advantage in getting elected. So when they say people's convention. That's kind of misleading. Can you um, understand or sympathize with um, mom and pop uh, public in the New York State, uh, in New York State, who are looking at the legislature and it's, listen, we've seen all the polls that call it the most dysfunctional legislature in the country. I mean, you may or may not agree, but people who say, you know what, especially in this day and age, I don't trust the elected officials. You know, we want to rest control of our government away from them and, and give people a chance. And you know what? Even though Assemblyman Dinowitz or others may not like the idea of having other names on as delegates, we think this is a good idea because these delegates, these are, these are people that we, you know, that, that, that are finally going to move things forward. Well, first, I'm one of those people who's frustrated like anybody else. If you're in the legislature, you have to be frustrated because you want to see things happen more rapidly than what happens. But the fact is, is that it's not going to be, you know, um, mom and pop average people who are going to get elected, those delegates. It's going to be people who are heavily financed by uh, various public, uh, uh, various uh, interest groups. It's going to be elected officials. So it'll, it'll very often be the same people as delegates who are the people that some people are blaming for the problems in the first place. And you know what? Uh, at, at every level of government, people get frustrated. How do you think that clown got elected president? Because people are frustrated. And now they're realizing they made a mistake. But the convention is, is just not going to solve those problems. It's like a pipe dream. You know what it is? It's like, it's like, it's like a snake oil salesman trying to t tell you how wonderful things are if you buy their product. That's not going to make the difference. And even if uh, some things could improve, 
we also run the risk of a lot of things happening that we are going to regret. So why would we take a chance on that? You talked about uh, the legislature having the authority to make the change in the Constitution if they so choose. Is there any stomach for that right now in the state legislature when they can't pass, when in New York State we can't pass the DREAM Act, and we talked about ethics reform, I don't want to go through the list uh, again. Is there any idea that uh, the state legislature now is going to look at the state constitution and make a, an amendment of any sort, and if so, what amendment would they make? We, we, since I've been in the legislature, we have made many, many amendments. I, I, I pointed out one this year that's on the ballot. Uh, we do this time after time. That's why there's been over 200 amendments passed by the voters, put on the ballot by the legislature. Uh, I would like to see some of these changes that you've talked about that you mentioned at the beginning of the show done, and some of them will be done. You know, uh, several years ago, people said we couldn't pass the $15 minimum wage. People said we couldn't pass uh, 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 paid leave, for example. Uh, we couldn't pass the SAFE Act. A lot of these things did get done. Did we get everything done? Of course not, but we've gotten a lot of things done. But whatever we get done, there'll be things that are undone and people complaining that we didn't get those things done, and rightly so. Uh, what I want to do, I want to take a short break. I, I, I'm getting a message that we may have uh, uh, former Assemblyman Benjamin uh, on the, either on the phone or something. So we're going to take a break, Assemblyman, and we'll be right back. We're going to find out how we're going to handle the second part of our show. Don't go away. Welcome, everybody. We are open. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS. You can catch me on there each and every night right after the quiet storm. You can catch me right here on open, 10 o'clock, 5 o'clock, and 10 o'clock. Let's just call it on the 10s and then just keep it tuned. And we got you covered like a blanket, okay? I'm out in the community and we're all over the place because we are now open. <laughs> Well, we did try like crazy to get uh, Mr. Benjamin, but the, the trains have slowed him up <laughs> impossibly. And so uh, here we are uh, still with Assemblyman Dinowitz. Uh, during the break, we were just talking about the cost. Um, there is a cost to this. Uh, and who, who pays for it? How much do you think it will be? And, and what are those costs? Uh, you pay for it. I pay for <laughs> it. And all the taxpayers pay for it. There are varying estimates, but I think based on everything I've seen, the cost of the convention is likely to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $100 million. Now, you may say, how could a convention cost that much? Well, there's, there's a, a, first of all, there's an election to, for the delegates to get elected. But beyond that, the, the, the delegates get paid. They hire staff. Uh, there's a whole lot of, uh, of things uh, that they'll have at their fingertips. 
And based on the cost of the convention from 50 years ago, if you project uh, with inflation uh, and other additional costs, it could easily be $100 million. And by the way, if the convention is held, which would be in the year 2019, if the voters vote yes uh, on November se uh, 7th, uh, the voters can still turn down everything, so it can be all for naught. Uh, so it could be a very expensive exercise. What, do you, what sense do you get, um, again, putting as, as easy as you can to uh, be uh, down the middle on this, what sense do you get from your constituents? Do you find that people are e expressing what I express, that many voters are very frustrated and they're saying, you know what? We really got to do something ourselves, or do you find that they're concerned, like you are, that this could uh, turn out well, to be uh, a bad situation? The people I talk, maybe I'm in a bubble. I mean, the people I talk to have, have mostly expressed concerns, but anybody who's a member of a union is, is voting no on this thing. Anybody who's an environmentalist is voting no. There was a press conference up in Albany today. Virtually every progressive group in the state opposes this, and some conservative groups as well. Now. The, some of the issues that supporters, and I, by the way, I applaud some of the supporters because they want to get some good things done that I want to get done. I just think they're wrong in the way they want to go about doing it. You know, things don't always happen as quickly as we would like. Sometimes it has to take a lot more time, and it's really frustrating. But I think New Yorkers have won many rights over the years that have to be protected. And in this era of Trump, we can't afford to put any of that on the chopping block. We can't afford to put them at risk. So uh, while understandably people may be upset about a lot of things, I would hope they'll turn over that ballot on Election Day and vote no on this convention. Uh, Assemblyman Dinowitz, we thank you for your time. And I'm, I'm sorry, I guess one of those things that doesn't move fast enough is the uh, MTA in our subways. Maybe we can and, pass an amendment. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, we will try to, uh, I know that we had uh, Mr. Benjamin on the Bronx Buzz, our uh, Bronx, that's other program that I host. And we talked about this issue. Maybe we can find another forum, maybe another edition of Bronx Talk uh, prior to the election to have him on and, and talk about it. So we do apologize to him. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things about living in the Bronx and living in New York City. But we thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, folks, if you do have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, like the slow subways, uh, then email them to us at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org. You can send a tweet to at Bronx Talk or post them on our Facebook page. We'll read them on the air during a future edition of our program. You can check out our archives at bronxnet.org. Dot org. You'll find Bronx Talk by following the watch menu on the new BronxNet website. Thanks to our producer, who is Lindsay, our director, William, and Helen is running the prompter and the cast of thousands, and to the assemblyman, to Mr. Benjamin, who's trying like heck to still get here. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.